Um, so, it, so uh, Everpedia, since you've done this uh, on other occasions uh, today and yesterday, is this being broadcast live now on Facebook Live, do you think? Yes, yes we are live on Facebook and oh. also we are being recorded. Great. Okay. Yes. So, um, Danielle, yeah? Yes. Uh, yeah, so we're um, going to be doing the panel today and we only have like an hour and a half. And um, the way the list looks like, we have Constantinos first, then uh, Eleni, then yourself, and then I will be the final presentation. And then uh, we can do questions and answers at the end. Um, everybody who's here today, do we agree that uh, we have 20 minutes to present for each person? Yes, can I say something? I don't know if um, uh, so Nikolai have informed you that I will present instead of LNE security. The, what? I will present the paper instead of LNE security on oh, behalf of LNE security. Okay, that's great. And, and you're Evangelos? Yes. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks very much. Nice to meet you. I think we've met before. Perhaps in Sosopol, I'm not sure. Yeah. Other semiotic conferences, I would imagine. <laughs> Excellent. So um, I, I guess everybody, we're ready to start. So we can start with Constantinos. Are you ready, Constantinos? Yeah. Great. And you're fine with... Uh, like presenting for 20 minutes and then we'll do the questions and answers at the very end after everybody has presented. Yeah, okay, no, no problem. Yeah, yeah, Evangelos, you're fine with that? Yep, excellent. And I know you are, Danielle. So uh, are you ready to start, Constantinos? And if you want to share your screen, that would be terrific. Uh, yes, I don't think if I can. Do I have the privileges yet? Um, let me just see. I, I, I would imagine that you do. Okay, let's try. Uh, yep, something's happening. Great. We okay. see your screen. Great. Very good. Uh, just a minute. Do you want us to let you know when we get to 15 minutes or when we're close to 20 minutes? Uh, yeah, with a signal, something I can see. Good. Okay. What? Okay. what like what, what, when we get to 20 minutes or you want me to give you like 19 15, minutes? 15. Hmm? 15 minutes. 15, okay, great, I will do. So whenever you're ready to start. Okay, so uh, my name is Konstantinos Mikos and I'm a PhD candidate in Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. And uh, the title of my presentation today is uh, Marketing Technoscience emergence of a new orientation. Uh, first, let's clarify some terms. Uh, technoscience is a part of STS, so-called STS studies, uh, science, technology, and society, uh, which is a discipline um, uh, focused on the interaction between science and its effects on society. The term technoscience was first introduced by Gaston Bacelard in 1934 but was popularized by Bruno Latour in 1987 in his work Science in Action, uh, where he says that he will use the word technoscience to describe all the elements tied to the scientific contents, no matter how dirty, unexpected, or foreign they seem. Uh, uh, at the later stage in ST studies, technoscience has got a bad reputation. Uh, then Song Vicente and Lever, for example, in 2018, defined technoscience as a means, uh, defined technoscience that it means the contamination of science by management of capitalism. However, uh, Latour did not use the term in such a way. Uh, he simply uh, insisted that technoscience has an inside because it has an outside. Inside meaning the people inside the lab and outside the people outside the lab. Uh, inside the lab, there are scientists and engineers, the people that have the technical know-how to produce science, scientific achievements, but uh, in order to do so, there are many other agents and relationships, uh, often uh, political or financial in nature, that are required in order for the people inside the lab 
to complete their work. So I will try to stick to that and try to avoid any bad connotations for the moment. And what is the problem with technoscience with high technology products? Well, the first one is that uh, high technology is often associated with an elevated degree of knowledge uh, that is required in every step of the process, from the production of a new scientific achievement to its marketing to the actual use. Often customers uh, have to go through a learning curve in order to be able to use uh, new products. Um, and the second one, second one is that high technology markets are often, uh, often uh, include uncertainty. Moriarty and Kosnick define this uncertainty as the ambiguity about the type and extent of customer needs that can be satisfied by technology. Now, uh, my concern here is uh, today, firstly, with, uh, um, mostly with the first aspect, how the elevated uh, knowledge required in, in this kind of products make it difficult to diffuse them uh, and what other parts are required contrary to other products. Um, the whole topic reminds us of uh, a common communication approach with the extended canonical model proposed by Somerset. Uh, and uh, he says that when a new item outside our culture uh, uh, tries to to be introduced into us, uh, this can be done through two different mechanisms. It can, it can be introduced as alter. You can see the pointer, right? On the left. Okay. Uh, as alter, meaning uh, something that is presented as different from us, uh, but also with some connections, so we can identify it as something different. And uh, the other mechanism is to be introduced as alius. Alius meaning something that is totally outside our culture and cannot be identified as a part of us. And uh, this can also happen in high technology products. And I'll present you two examples. Uh, in the first image, on the top one, uh, you can see a, a shot from a video produced for a product called Tutor Ever Dry. It is a kind of insulating material. And in the video, two gloves are spread. Uh, we can see two gloves. One of them is sprayed with the material, the right one. The other is not. They are dipped into mud. And as they go out, we can see almost miraculously the mud going down. An image that we're not accustomed to. So the narrative of this uh, video is that this product is something completely new, completely exotic, like nothing you've ever seen before, so the, uh, the technique used it reminds us of the alus we mentioned before. In the second image, we see, the, the product is the jacket, uh, we see an elderly lady, uh, the shot is from a, a Greek uh, television commercial, uh, the lady is a very uh, well-known celebrity here in Greece, she's an actress, and she is portrayed to, to wear the jacket, to um, demonstrate it, she's full of emotion. Suppose that the jacket is made of nanomaterials and it can offer uh, increased heat and uh, comfort for people who have uh, some kind of muscle pain and things like that. So we can see a, to a totally different picture for something that is supposed to be high tech, nanotechnology. It's a jacket, it's something that we already knew. But this is an improved version of it, something that is better than the already known to us jacket. And we can see here that the approach is that of the alter, something that we have some degree of familiarity with. Now, let's see this uh, from a different approach, from a marketing approach. Cotter uh, in 2000. Uh, states that there are five different marketing orientations that uh, a company can employ for its products. Uh, and I quote him, uh, companies can adopt one of five orientations over the marketplace. The production concept assumes that consumers want widely available affordable products. That is, the products exist, the customer needs exist, but that's lacking this availability, we have to improve production. 
The product concept assumes that consumer wants products with the most quality, performance, or innovative features. Uh, there is an established customer need, but we haven't yet made the level of quality we want for the product, so we have to create the product. The selling concept assumes that customers will not buy enough products without an aggressive selling and promotion effort. That is, we have lots of products, but there is no need for them, so we have to cultivate the need. The marketing concept assumes the firm must be better than competitors in creating, delivering, and communicating customer value. So, in this approach, we have the products, we have the customer needs, but we also have competitors, so we have to increase the competitiveness of the product. The final one is the society, societal marketing concept, which assumes that the firm must satisfy customers more effectively and efficiently than competitors, while still preserving the consumers and the society's well-being. So, in this approach, we do have the product, we do have the customer need, it is well established, there are also competitors, but we have to do so in an effective way and not in an intrusive way. Uh, what I want to to emphasize here is that in all of these orientations, at least one of the two, the product or the customer name, already exists. But, and uh, we can see that some, some parallels with the communication model presented before. In the product orientation, a customer need pre exists, something is already inside our country, and a product, a new product, must be made in order to satisfy it something that is outside the culture and then must be introduced, either by uh, an alias or another uh, approach. In the selling validation, uh, the product already pre-exists, the customer need must be cultivated, but it's still something inside the culture, it must be cultivated inside the culture, so there's no introduction. Um, we could say that, to this point, the parallel is that the customer need is something inside the culture, and the product is something that might be outside the culture and needs to be introduced. For this reason, there is lots of uh, talk about the integration and, uh, uh, between research and development and marketing. Griffin and Hauser uh, say that to succeed in today's marketplace, most corporations must engender cooperation between the marketing and research and development. Um, but the idea was uh, expressed even earlier, in 1954, by Drucker, where he says there is only one valid definition of business purpose to create a customer. Therefore, any business enterprise has two and only two basic functions, marketing and innovation. And the way I see it is that marketing uh, has to do with the introduction of a product into the culture and the innovation is, with the, is about the creation of the product. Now, uh, when Drucker says, Creating a customer, I, I don't want it to say, I don't, I don't want this expression to sound too offensive. Uh, what he actually meant is that creating a customer means drawing a connection between a product and the customer, but assuming that at least one of them already exists. What I want to show you is that the main proposal of this presentation is that we can witness a new orientation emerging in high technology products. One which does not take for granted either the product or the customer need to pre-exist. Let me show you an example. Uh, I suppose we are all familiar with uh, robotic vacuum cleaners by now. Um, the idea is not something new. I think the first robotic cleaner was uh, made in uh, 1987 and was called the, the RoboCat. Now you can imagine that it was something very big, something very ugly, and like we said, something very difficult for consumers to understand how it was working. So it didn't go well. In 2002, a company called iRobot introduces the Roomba, which is, it was the, the first uh, commercially successful uh, robotic vacuum cleaner. But if we stop for a minute and think about it, we already had vacuum cleaners. There was no void in the market. We already had such products. And even if we didn't like using them because there was some exercise involved, we could also always hire someone to do it for us. So there was no need in the market for something 
new. So the company, which by the way was uh, initially a supplier for, for robotic equipment for the US Army and US uh, heavy industry, decided at some point to enter the retail market. Uh, they contacted Hasbro, but uh, let's say did not reach an agreement about some toys, and they said, okay, what else can we do? Let's make a bacon clear. But because there was no void and they were aware of that, they uh, made some first prototypes and gave them to the employees of the company so they could tell them how it was going, what were their uh, ideas, and there was uh, uh, a whole process that lasted years before the final product was introduced to the public. And even then, it was not called a robot yet. Uh, because they were afraid from, uh, about the connotations a robot would bring, a, you could actually bring a robot to have a choice for you inside the house. So uh, the need was developed alongside the product, step by step. And this is something new happening in high technology products right now. We have the product and the marketing is uh, developing alongside the product uh, hand by hand. So let's see what conclusions can we reach. Uh, we saw that traditional marketing orientations include cre either creating a product for an already established customer need, which can then the product can be understood, can be introduced either through an alias or alter communicative approach, or cultivating a need for an already pre existing product. And what we see now is that in a high technology environment, there is an immense correlation that creating the product and the need happens at the same time. I don't want to present this as something necessarily evil as is often expressed in the techno scientist course. After all, we can all understand that in order to produce new technology, we need to be um, uh, also, uh, there has to be some good uh, planning for business. Uh, and always, there is, I, I, I imagine that there is less effort required to create a new culture than to overthrow an already established one. But this, of course, would lead to a very much needed and required discussion about classification of our needs. Is a new need uh, that is offered to me by company, by product, better or most, more important than the ones I already have? Or perhaps I had some needs that I was not aware of and the new product um, uh, brings me to a point where I realize that. But from, most importantly, from a semiotic point of view, we can see that the semiotic framework and groundwork uh, precedes the creation of the actual product. And in communication terms, we could say that maybe we can talk about an expansion of the aforementioned communication models. The creation of culture precedes the creation of the actual message. That is, in the case presented, there was a strong effort to prepare the ground inside culture for a message that was not yet devised. It was devised at a later point. And this, in my opinion, is an expansion to the current communication models. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. So that was, yes, that was less than 20 minutes. So that's terrific. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, that. Thank you very much, Konstantinos. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. So the next person we have, so we're going to be having questions at the end, yeah? So the next person we have is uh, Eleni, and um, she's not going to be able to be here today. So we have another person who is presenting in her place, which is uh, Evangelos, right? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the topic is the semiotics of plus mobile advertising. Uh, it is not coincidence that fashion has long been one of the most favorite subjects for the study of semiotics by leading semioticians such as Gary Mass and Barthes. Instead for Barth, fashion is a system of signifiers, a classificatory activity, a semiotic order activity. This is because fashion conveys uh, special cultural and social messages. 
Danesi argues that the semiotic study of clothing demonstrates that it is hardly just a study of physical survival, but rather a tendency turning everything we dress ourselves in into a sign. This study examines a new practice in the field of fashion advertising, which is that of uh, flashy mobile advertising. Very often, we see large companies which are active in the field of fashion ab abandoning the discrete position in which they used to place the brand of their product for a more prominent place on their clothes or accessories, thus acting, featuring as a flashy form of mobile advertising. In this way, companies try to promote themselves in a smarter manner as they achieve a form of mobile advertising using the consumers themselves as advertising media. This allows consumers to see and explore fashion products live and in real time, in other words, not in magazines, uh, shops, windows, or even online stores, but on the person uh, wearing the garment. Um, why this is important for brand? Because a brand has a semiotic value. Um, according to Califato, the clothed body is both a subject and an object of visuality. It looks at other bodies in the movement of imitation and uh, is looked at uh, as a model of distinction. In this sense, uh, clothing represents a sort of translation among bodies and among cultures. This is not uh, um, by chance that uh, also Lodman has been uh, stating, has been referring to the cultural value of, mold, of fashion. Uh, the process of branding aims to establish in the mind of the consumer a corporate presence that is distinct from the existing competition in the market and which on the other hand seeks uh, to attract new consumers while on the other hand manages to maintain the relationship that is already has with existing consumers. Therefore, through branding, companies aim to impose a unique brand as an image uh, and a form in the conscience of the consumers. As Kotler argues, a brand is any label that carries meaning and associations. What is the research methodology adopted by Amy um, Sikyotki? Uh, she attempts to study four well-known well companies of the fashion industry. More specifically, uh, he, she studies fashion products of the Tommy Hilfiger, Gantt, Guess and Ted Baker companies. She presents educatively exams belonging to the two first companies. They are companies which offer to the consumers who wish, who wish to spend more money on their appearance, quality daily fashion covering their needs for purchasing branded items. And the goal of this company is uh, high quality and mass consumption of branded products available in the global market. Um, Ms. Chiotti uh, is, um, adopts uh, the, the, the visual rhetoric uh, of, adopted by Barnes in the rhetoric of images, but anchorage function. Uh, as Barnes proclaims, the text leads the reader through the signifies of the image, causing him or her to avoid some signifies and perceive others. By means of uh, an often submission, the text remote controls him or her towards the meaning chosen in advance. And in all these cases of anchorage, language clearly has a function of elucidation. She also adopts um, uh, the classification made by Zamari Flos about the categories of advertisements. Uh, Zamari Flos uh, categorizes, uh, uh, detects four categories of advertisements those who focus on the usuality those whose focus, which focus on the needs and desires of the consumer, those which focus on the pleasure, and finally those which focus on the price. Uh, I will start presenting the examples uh, selected. Um, the well-known company Tommy Hilfiger has launched, especially in the new series of products, its brand in a very showing way, that is with bold and big sized letters. The brand of the company, as you can see in the figures one and two, is portrayed in large size and small letters, and it assumes uh, a more personal character since it looks like a signature. We also observe that it is very young people of both sexes that consume um, these products for daily use. It is worth mentioning that um, the pack pack in figure two, apart from the large size brand of the company, that is according to Danesi, a letter brand, is covered in its entire surface by, a typical, by the typical clothes that represent it, that is white, red, and blue, the, the synthetic colors of the company. This chromatic choice makes presence of the company even more apparent by anchoring the consumer. Uh, more specifically, the company has launched a new global advertising campaign in the market for the products called Tommy Jeans, which address younger ages, 
And in this case, the brand, uh, this letter brand, is usually displayed in large letters, as you can see in the figure three. Um, the letter brand is also displayed at the center of the product, and the linguistic messages become gradually shorter as uh, we move from the top to the bottom of the product. Uh, the company continues to cover the needs uh, of older people and people who wish to adopt a more professional look and who belong to a different target group, displaying at the same time its classic timeless, timeless products, either by way of the company's characteristic trade name, symbolic brand, or by way of its discrete font uh, the brand uses, letter brand, and the distinctive colors of white, red, and blue. As one can observe in figures four and five, this time the company's products are not chosen by very young people. Although we, don't, we do not see the faces of the models, the company suggests a more classic style in this case. We can also detect in figure six the effort the company makes to respond to the needs of women who are not very young, but having products in which the brand appears in capital letters uh, of intermediate size which is discreet, but at the same time makes its presence felt. Um, in, um, in this figure, in figure six, a young woman dressed uh, in an everyday casual outfit is holding a Tommy Hilfiger bank uh, in her hands. The woman seems very happy and she gazes at the bag which, it, uh, which is prevails in her look. The next company study is the well-known company Guess, it is an American clothing brand and retailer which um, manufactures clothing for both men, uh, both men and women, as well as fashion accessories such as watches, jewelry, perfumes, uh, bags and shoes. It is a company that states uh, its presence strongly through the choice of design, clothes, uh, colors and textures, as you can see in figure seven. Uh, yes, is a company with a very dynamic logo which does not go unnoticed when it comes to consumers. The bold capital letters of the brand, as well as the act that, it, uh, that it features in big size on the company's product, is what characterizes it, as we can see in figures uh, 7, 8, and 9. Especially in figure 7, the brand covers almost half of the side surface of the product. Moreover, the brand of the company appears in bold fonts and double colors. It is a footwork product of the main series of the company, and despite the fact that there is no model in the picture, we assume that uh, it addresses young people uh, due to its modern uh, design. We could make similar observation concerning figures eight uh, and nine, which also rely on uh, footwork products, although in these images the colors of the products are black and white. In figure nine, there is a model whose face does not appear, but just as in figure eight, consumers assume from the product style that the product addresses young people. Interestingly, in both figures, uh, nine and eight, the brand of the company, which is a letter brand, um, also covers a large area of the surface of the product and is placed at the front and at the back of the product respectively. In this way, when the consumer observes the product, he or she can spot the brand name from all sides. Um, the guest company uh, aims to cater for a large part uh, for, of the needs of the consumers of different age and style. For this reason, it also sells classic footwear products that bear a more modern look and uh, where the presence of the brand uh, is uh, discreet, uh, you can see in figure 10, such products are most likely chosen not only by younger but also by older people who prefer a more classic style in their daily lives. After all, these are sports footwear that are products that are usually selected for more everyday looks. Uh, the company's brand also dominates the product uh, in figure 11. Bold letters, geometric shapes and symbols form the iconic message of the product which covers a large area of it and includes the brands of the company. The model featuring in, the, in this figure is young and dressed in casual style. It is worth mentioning that the placement of uh, his hands is portrayed in a way that highlights the iconic message, uh, the brand of the company. Uh, after all, this is the objective of the image uh, to anchor the consumer. Um, we can see in figure 12, uh, the typical symbol of the company serves, uh, which serves as a pattern and covers the entire product. These are the most classic products of the company, which are characterized by a sense of timeliness 
and that perhaps chosen by women of almost all ages who wish to adopt a more elegant and branded look. In this way, the company gains recognition and establishes its own style in the market. Uh, now I will present the final, the concluding remarks. Um, the, according to, to the security, the marketing strategy of each company moves along two paths, the functional and the symbolic. Uh, on the one hand, the consumer serves as a promotional item, using and at the same time promoting the branded uh, product. And on the other hand, he or she has the ability to recognize, compare, evaluate, and finally choose and consume a branded product used by another consumer. Um, the anchorage function that is achieved in some cases uh, may also be the advertising goal of the companies. More specifically, in the Tommy Hilfiger company, we detect the anchorage function as defined by BART only in some cases. On the other hand, the anchorage function cannot be traced in any of the products of the guest company that have been examined for the purpose of this study despite the high dynamic brand. At the same time, fashion enforces new codes of communication and reveals another dimension, namely that of dynamic and flashy. People who choose to consume products with specific characteristics may wish to stand, uh, to stand out because of their stylistic choices of the identifiable uh, products that showcase their economic, professional, social status. Furthermore, the size of the brand varies, ranging from the classic and discrete brand of the company to very large letters. The companies adopt such grading uh, of the size of their brand in their effort to meet the needs of a wide range of consumers who belong to different target groups. Finally, um, most of the selected products to study bear a, a letter brand and only few products display a symbolic brand. This remark alludes uh, to a broader trend of letter brand promotion and more specifically, the big size uh, letter brand. The size and the form of the company's brand with respect to the weight that appears on the product studied, leave them being evaluated differently in the mind and consequently in the purchasing choices of the consumer. The brand name of the product stop, uh, stops being discreet and perhaps symbolic, and it becomes very flashy, endowing the product as well as the person who consumes it with a different dimension altogether. I think that we're very good in time. Thank you very much. Yes, that was excellent. Uh, perfect timing. Thank you very much and very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Danielle, we're going to be having uh, you next, yes? Perfect. Uh, so yes. <clears throat> Hello, I will uh, share the screen uh, now. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. okay. So please uh, confirm me if you can see the presentation. We don't see anything yet. We just okay. see. So I will try to share the screen now. Okay. Excellent. Something's happening. Okay. Good. Okay. Good stuff. <laughs> probably. We see it. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Um, yeah. I'll try to move this part of the... Okay. It looks good. We see now your okay. first so, slide. And okay, thank you. So my name is uh, Obada Daniel Radesh. I'm a lecturer at uh, Alexandria Ankuza University of Yash at the Department of Communication Sciences and Public Relations. And uh, my paper for today is about uh, fake news in online environment. Actually, my title is Understanding online fake news consumption through the reader's eyes, an eye-tracking approach. This study is part of another uh, research project that was supported by a grant of the Alexandria Rancosa University of Yash. And the research project title is the role of flow in sharing fake news about brands on social media. So actually this is just an exploratory study and I will uh, tell you more about it in the next minutes. Let's talk about uh, some um, key aspects regarding fake news and online users. First of all, the number of internet users has increased exponentially in the last years. For example, in April 2021, we have 4.7 billion users of uh, internet. And also, we had around uh, 4.3 billion 
users of social media. So as we can see from uh, data report or statistics, the penetration rate in our population is quite high. Also, online social media is changing the way in which we consume news and information because online users can only learn about the trending events, but they can also share their stories and advocate for different problems and issues. Another study conducted by the Pew Research Center in 2017 uh, show that 66% of US adults used Facebook and 45% of them got their news from this platform. Also, we have some statistics about YouTube and uh, Twitter. And the conclusion is that users uh, inform or find news about different types of events using social media. So the information spread on social media as news sometimes is suspicious and in some cases, is intended to mislead. Such content is often called fake news. After the 2016 US presidential election campaign, believe it to be influenced by fake news, scholars and communication practitioners seek to understand the fake news phenomenon. So we have a lot of studies, we have a high number of studies, we have different papers emerging from different fields, such as political communication, library science, journalism, psychology, philosophy, information sciences, business communication, that focus on fake news origin, distribution, and effects. In this context, because fake news outperformed real news in terms of popularity and engagement on social media, understanding fake news consumptions becomes crucial. The next part of uh, my uh, research project was uh, a literature review. For example, fake news uh, is not a new phenomenon, although we are discussing about fake news lately in social media context. And this is because the partisan press has always peddled biased opinions and stories lacking factual biases. Of course, new technologies from the telegraph and the four social media algorithms have led to fake news proliferation. We have, for example, an article by Montgomery McGovern in 1898 in the Arena Journal entitled An Important Phase of Gutter Journalism, Faking. And in this article, Montgomery complains about fake journalists, considered to be the most sensational stories published by news organization and explains the Stanford technique used by fakers to deceive. They use a reputable member of the community, such as a doctor, a dentist, an architect, or other professional or businessman who, for money, would corroborate the fake story. So as we can see, the fake news is not actually a new phenomenon, but in the context of social media, indeed, um, we can witness a uh, proliferation. Also, when we are discussing about the fake news phenomenon, we should take into account the post-truth era. Although fake news is not new, the scale of the problem has grown exponentially in the last years, and it should be analyzed in the post-truth era context. The term post-truth was first used in 1992 by Tessie to describe a mostly political environment in which debate is framed by appealing to emotion with repeated assertions of half-truths and outright lies, those factual rebuttals are ignored. So we have some characteristics of the post-truth era First of all, emotions and personal beliefs are more important than facts. The truth and the story no longer matters. There is a mistrust in authority and messages appeal to negative emotions such as fear or anxiety. Rushland argues that in the post-truth era, facts and evidence have been replaced with personal beliefs and emotion. Fake news no longer stand for factless or slanderous news, but rather news that are considered to attack a person's pre-existence beliefs. A key aspect to take into consideration is the nature of the news and what people accept as news rather than facts. Also, Rushland argues that nowadays the society has shifted towards a belief and emotion-based market. Fake news stories that spread via social media intervene with journalists and become primary sources of information because they are considered by people to be real news. 
Therefore, in this context, understanding users' fake news consumption while surfing in social media becomes crucial. Uh, also, um, after a critical review, we have identified some conceptualization of news and fake news. First of all, let's start with a definition for news. News refers to an accurate account of a real event. Of course, the term of fake news seems to be correlated with the term of news, and our critical literature review uh, regarding fake news conceptualizations reveal the broad range of definitions proposed by different scholars and fractioneers. And I have some examples in order to better understand the concept of fake news. For example, Oremus defines fake news as information that is designed to be confused with legitimate news and is intentionally false. Laser and his colleagues conceptualize fake news as news stories that were fabricated but presented as in from legitimate sources and promoted on social media to deceive the public for ideological or financial gain. Zhang and Gorbani consider fake news to encompass all kinds of false stories or news that are mainly published and distributed on the internet in order to purposely mislead, befool, or lure readers for financial, political, or other gains. Of course, these are just some examples of definitions regarding fake news. However, our critical literature review regarding fake news definitions identified uh, two categories of definitions. First of all, uh, we can identify in the literature broader definitions of fake news, for example, the European Union high-level experts group consider fake news to be disinformation that includes all forms of false, inaccurate, or misleading information designed, presented, and promoted to intentionally cause public harm or profit. This is a broader definition of fake news. As we can see, uh, it's not uh, so clear if fake news is disinformation or uh, is misleading information. However, it's uh, presented in this uh, broader context. And also, we can identify narrow definitions of fake news. For example, the definition proposed by Alcott and Jenk Thompson. Fake news is intentionally and verifiably wrong or false news produced for the purpose of earning money and or promoting ideologies. The authors consider fake news to be news articles that are intentionally and verifiable fake, false and could mislead readers. Of course, on this continuum regarding fake news definitions, we have a broad range of conceptualization. So the broad definition of fake news encompasses deliberate attempts at disinformation and distortion of the news, uh, the use of filtered version to promote ideologies, confuse, sow discontent, and create polarization. The European Union, Union high-level experts group consider the narrow definition of fake news to be more appropriate for empirical studies because it requires an identifiable and well-defined set of false news articles and sources to measure the reach and impact of false news. Therefore, in this study, we assume the narrow definition of fake news from the literature because we consider it to be more appropriate to understand users' fake news consumption while surfing in social media. What type of fake news can be spread in online environment? If uh, we conduct a critical literature review, we will find many types of fake news. The most common types are clickbait, which are article with dubious factual content presented with misleading headlines designed for the simple goal of generating many views. We have also satire or parody, which are pieces of writings in which authors use humor, irony, exaggeration, ridicule, and false information to comment on current events. We can identify also imposter content when genuine sources are impersonated with false made up sources misinformation, which is inaccurate information that could mislead people, whether it results from an honest mistake, negligence, unconscious bias, or intentional deception. 
misleading content with this disingenuous use of information to frame an issue or an individual, false connections when highlights or visual of captation fail to support the content, false content when genuine content is shared with false contextual information, manipulated content when genuine information or imaginary is manipulated to deceive, this information, which is intentional, misleading, inaccuracy, or falsity, and fabricated content, outright false information. As we can see, there are many cases in which one may classify a given article as fake news only if one takes into account the communication context and the recipient's priori knowledge about the subject. So these were some uh, key theoretical aspects for the, for the theoretical background of our study. So the aim of our study was to better understand the user's fake news consumption while surfing in social media. Based on the studies we reviewed from the literature, the following research questions were proposed. Which area of interest from a fake news attract immediate attention, the title, the lead, or the story? Which elements from a fake news don't attract participants' attention? Are there any elements from a fake news being ignored? In, in, in which order are the elements of a fake news noticed? Is there a significant difference between fake news title, lead and stories, areas of interest? So these were the research questions that lead our study. And uh, here are some methodological uh, information. The participants were 42 students from Alexandria Lankuza University that agreed to take part of our uh, study. They received credit for the practice. Also, they completed a screener questionnaires. And they provided information about the eye because the technique used was the eye tracking and the data was collected in October 2019 before the pandemic. The task was a navigation task. The participant need to access the Facebook page of a news website, of course, a Romanian uh, website, in order to search news about 5G, 5G technology. The stimuli we used, as we can see here, was actually a made up news, a fake news. So a fake news was created and shared in the news feed about a fake company that developed a research program with the 5G technology. So according to the fake news, XQ Data, an American company, sorry if I <laughs> chosen this, uh, uh, reference, but uh, in this uh, space we have the latest technology. So uh, this uh, this company managed to teleport the first bio organism using 5G technology. And of course a disclaimer was posted at the end of the fake news stating that the information was not verified from independent sources and may contain inaccurate, incomplete or false information. So here in, on the right side of the slide, you can see um, the news we created, the title and also the lead and the text and also the um, disclaimer. The instrument we used was a GP3 research grade eye tracker. The eye tracker was used to objectively monitor where, when and what individuals look at and to quantify their visual attention while reading the fake news. Uh, we have some characteristics about this um, uh, eye tracking. Um, the main point is that the technology provides valuable insights into the distribution of visual attention over a scene and, of course, is restricted to monitoring oval vision, which is a small region in the center of the retina involved in processing light from the center of the visual field with a dense concentration of cone receptors that provide high visual Acuity, and we have to state this uh, that the eye tracking lacks peripheral vision, so we cannot capture the peripheral vision of the participants. We used Gates Point Analyzes Professional Software Package to uh, analyze the results. So this was uh, the eye tracking we used, and uh, of course we had a protocol in order to uh, standardize. Uh, the actions. First, the participants were invited to the experimental laboratory and were asked to feel comfortable. They completed a pre-selection questionnaire. The subjects that suffered visual impairments were excluded from the studies. They received the informed consent 
which they carefully read and signed as a result of their agreement to participate in the study. The participants were invited to sit on a chair in front of a PC monitor where the eye tracking was located. We presented the instruction for calibrating the device and performed the calibration test with the eye tracking system using five points. The participants started the navigation tasks according to the instructions. After we finished the data collection session, the participants received a copy of the informed consent and were reassured of data confidentiality. And of course, at the end, we thank the participants for their time and offer to send a copy of the research report after publication. Um, here we have some uh, uh, images during uh, the study. So this was the setup with uh, um, the eye tracker. And of course, here uh, we have some uh, first analysis. Um, the first stage was to validate the data collected with the eye tracker. And in this um, image, as we can see in the left corner here, here we should see the participants' eyes. And this is a type of invalid experiment because the eye tracking calibration failed. So um, we had some cases in which the experiments were invalid because during the experiment, the participants knew, uh, moved uh, their head uh, quite, uh, uh, quite significantly and uh, the eye tracker couldn't capture their gazes. So we had also some eye tracking metrics that we use in order to analyze the data. The gaze points, which are the basic units of measures, the fixation, which are series of gaze points close in time and range, Secondates the eye movements between fixation, fixation sequences, which are based on fixation positions and timing information that can generate the fixation sequences and heat maps, which are static or dynamic aggregation of gaze points and fixations revealing the distribution of visual attention. So because we don't have so much time, I will briefly present the results. Uh, in this image, as we can see, we have an example of bee swarm, which presents the gaze points and the fixation of participants. So here is the title of the fake news. Here is the image. And this is just an image in which we can see each gaze of the participant as a bee. And if we, um, if we access the video file, we can see them flying around those zones, indicating the points the visual was uh, pointed out. So this first type of information was quite important in order to determine um, the fixation of the visual attention. Also, um, we have here uh, another example. This is another analyze of bee swarms, uh, this time uh, considering the lead and the text. So this is the lead of the news and this is the text. And so, and also we have um, a last section in the news, the disclaimer I was talking about in which we stated that this information could be false and are not um, uh, verified by independent sources. As we can see, we have uh, different points for each participant indicated that uh, their visual attention was on the text. Also, uh, this image indicates the fixation map. So uh, using this type of analysis, we can see for each participant, this is actually an aggregated analysis, but for each participant, we can see the fixation. So each dot, each B is the fixation point. And as you can see here, we have the time um, of the gates being fixed on that specific point. So we could calculate um, the points and the time they spend on each element of our uh, fake news. And this is the case also for um, the lead and also for the text. As you will see later, actually we had uh, just a few participants that read the disclaimer. Of course, the disclaimer was at the end of the uh, article, but um, we will see that just a few of them read uh, this disclaimer. Also, 
Another analysis we conducted was the heat maps. This you know, type of analysis uh, represents a dynamic aggregation of gaze points and fixation. As we can see in this um, image, uh, where uh, we can uh, find red spots, that means that the attention was focused on um, a larger time. And when uh, we have blue spots, that means that the attention was just fixed there for a small time. And we have also information about the areas they fix their attentions and also how much time they spend on that uh, particular spot. And this is also an aggregated um, analysis for the lead and for the text. And uh, finally, I think this is uh, also a very interesting analysis. The name is heat map and represents the dynamic aggregation of gaze points and fixation. But this time is like we can see um, the text, the news, as we were the participants of the study. So this is why the title of this paper was Understanding Fake News Consumption Using Eye Tracking through the reader's eyes. So this is the reader's perspective. Of course, it's an aggregated perspective for the all participants. But uh, the interesting stuff is that, uh, of course, uh, all of them read the title. And uh, as we will see, they read also uh, the lead and the text, but uh, they didn't read uh, the disclaimer. So um, this was a part of our analysis. And there are also some uh, additional uh, analysis. Uh, we created areas of interest, which is an eye tracking tool to select regions of a displayed stimulus and to extract metrics specifically for those regions, such as time to first fixation, average fixation, time view, number of revisitors, and number of average revisitors. So we created three areas of interest for the fake news title, for the lead, and for the story. We extracted metrics specifically for those regions. And the results indicated different fake news consumptions. So all the participants read the title of the news and they first and the first sentence, the lead. 20 of them read also the lead. And finally, 40%, uh, 14 participants read the entire fake news. So the fixation map indicates different reading patterns between participants. Also, an additional area of interest was created for disclaimer section. And this, sex, this section was viewed only by five participants. Uh, I will just present briefly the conclusion. Um, the result of this exploratory study suggests that respondents visually scan the text before they stop their gaze on different sections of the fake news, that meaning uh, the title, the lead, the body, and the disclaimer. The results of the three area of interest highlight that all the participants read the title of the news and the first sentence. Many of them read the lead and just a part of them read the entire fake news. The fixation maps indicate different reading patterns between participants and this insight uh, could be important because outlines um, how important is a title and a lead when uh, we create a news and especially when uh, we are talking about fake news. Also, another important finding is that the disclaimer section placed at the end of the news was, was viewed only by a small number of participants. In this section, the publisher stated that the information was not verified from independent sources and may contain inaccurate, incomplete, or false information. Therefore, we consider that this element has a limited efficiency in preventing readers about potential fake information that was published. Um, so researchers can use eye tracking to explore if some elements of fake news are being ignored or overlooked and to identify where responders look and how much time they spend in processing visual and textual information using objective measures. Eye tracking can be used to understand online fake news consumption and objectively measure the distribution of visual attention where respondents look, how much time they spend in, and if they ignore or overlook some elements from a fake news. Of course, uh, this study has um, limitation. First of all, uh, there are limitations determined by the research design. Uh, 
there are testing errors, stress errors, selections errors that could intervene with uh, the results uh, we just discussed. And also, uh, there is a, a limit of eye tracking technology. As uh, I stated before, uh, eye tracking cannot account for peripheral vision. And this means that participants could um, uh, process a great deal of information using this part of the visual system. So this was my uh, presentation. I hope uh, uh, I manage uh, the time uh, quite good. Yes. Yeah, it was great, uh, Daniel. Yeah, it was 25, it was 25 minutes. Okay, so, so I'm sorry if I, uh, I just uh, uh, took some time from the other participants, but <laughs> we had a little bit more time. Thank you for your, your attention. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent. I'm very interested in uh, eye tracking. So that was very, very good for me. Okay. Uh, if Danielle, if you can let me know if you see my screen. Yeah. So now it's my time to be uh, the guest and I will introduce Carl Jones, which will present the paper about decolonizing advertising. So we can see your screen. Uh, I'm just going to make the image bigger. Okay. Does that work? Yes, yes, it's okay. Good. Okay, so I will uh, start. So today with my PhD research, I will perform a semiotic analysis to explore the visual representations of the um, power relationships in Mexico's political economy as expressed in 2D advertising and how these relationships can be resisted through the analysis of secondary messaging and further regulation. And this Mexican Visual Communications Review investigates the current visual practice and printed expressions of 2D visual communication in Mexico City by focusing on a billboard campaign that was broadcast early in 2018 from the luxury department store Palacio Diero. First, the 2D advertising is deconstructed through the analysis of the advertising tools and techniques supported through semiotic and design theory. Then this is followed by a semiotic analysis influenced by various semioticians such as Roland Barthes, applications of Sussor semiotic theory applied to popular culture in rhetoric of the image, and Danesi's observations on media semiotics. Harrison and Jewett and Romico on visual social semiotics and ending with Stuart Hall's observations on audiences through encoding and decoding. The objective of this analysis is to discover the primary and secondary messaging broadcast by advertising to the consumer and map how the messaging is constructed through the application of advertising tools and techniques. But first, let me define advertising. Uh, advertising is a designed communication that reinterprets signs and symbols in order to persuade. And or I define decolonizing as involving removing or rewriting rules and concepts left by colonial era thinking that still control or influence society. Now let's look at media semiotics. The branded sponsored messages that are produced and broadcast by the ruling families in Mexico and large international corporations are text composed of signs and codes blended through the combination of words and images and expressed in one of the most accessible mass mediums outdoor. And this is in order to persuade Mexicans. Marcel Danesi uh, in Toronto believes that the brands are the most important modes of communication in the modern media environment. And I propose that advertising messages reinforce these social and cultural values through myth creation. As Barth notes, a myth is a type of speech. And myth is history in form and concept. Form in this case are images of race and class and the concept is the way race and class is constructed through the manipulation of elements such as images, text, and brand logo to create a mythical brand narrative. 
It is important to note that advertising agencies mediate the communicative exchange between consumers and marketing institutions as cultural intermediaries who generate symbolic meaning for commodities. But according to Kelly, the process of how agencies encode meaning into messages remains underexplored. And that is why this research is valuable to understand the process of the tools and techniques used to construct these sponsored mythical messages. Barth's application of the Susarian model of signifier plus signified equal sign to advertising can bring insights such as myth creation into symbolic messaging applied to global brands such as Marlboro. These are instrumental in exporting capitalism to non-Western nations through globalization. So for example, he observes that the colonial myth for the consumer brand Marlboro cigarettes, whose brand character was designed through the creation of a positive sign, such as a male cowboy. This American icon is usually associated with the history of European occupation of the American West. However, this representation of maleness is a sign that has been removed from its original context, that of the American genocide, into one that represents hyper-American masculinity sold to consumers around the world through with the branding of a pack of cigarettes. It is important to note that advertising messages are created by visual communicators and the designers have power and control over the signs and how they are combined to create unique messages that can change the original intent of the signs used. In order to study signs, it is also important to look at the audience and the different theories on how signs can be received. In addition to how messages are constructed through decoding signs, it is also valuable to understand how audiences perceive messages. In the 80s, British theorist Stuart Hall wrote a paper called Decoding and Encoding, and how there were three different positions for audiences. Uh, to able to decode meanings within cultural text, their dominant hegemonic position, the negotiated and the oppositional. Within the dominant hegemonic position, there's little understanding of miscommunication as both the sender and the receiver are working under the same rules, assumptions and cultural biases. For the purpose of this study, I will focus on Hall's first position, dominant hegemonic, in order to decode the receivers identified by Hall with the objective of decoding the outdoor advertising of Palacio de Hierro. So now let's look at the case study. This study was conducted within Mexican uh, capitalist economy with branded messages that were broadcast in 2018 on privately owned mass outdoor media. The brand selected represents a company, Palacio de Hierro, owned by one of the ruling Mexican families called Bayares, who are based in Mexico City. The original campaign consisted of five billboards, various magazine and newspaper ads, along with television and radio. The same messages, models, and themes were used in all medias. For this study, I will look at the five ads from the billboard campaign and will focus on an ad called Freckles. The company Palacio Diero is a department store that sells luxury brands to wealthy A and A plus markets in major urban centers in Mexico. Owned by one of the richest family, they have created also their own anti-Marxist private university called ETAM and imposed their personal social values by approving this long running campaign that promotes the white ideal lifestyle and reinforces class structure. The Palacio campaign for this study was first broadcast on billboards in March and attempts to make the brand appear diverse. A press article describes it as a campaign that breaks stereotypes. The ads feature models who have European features that represent the following stereotypes marked skin, old age, androgyny, and overweight. The ads were placed in various medias, and for the purpose of this research, I will examine the outdoor billboards, um, and I will look at their tools and techniques that were used to create these billboards, uh, followed 
by a traditional semiotic study. So I'm going to show you two uh, semiotic studies that I did. And this is to understand how the ads are constructed using advertising tools and techniques, and then to understand how the consumer perceives the advertising. So I will now map the construction of the Palacio advertisements by examining the tools and techniques used to create them. Uh, here you can see that uh, I'm, I'm going to show you sort of how I sort of put everything together. So for tools, I looked at typography, color systems, the medium where it was placed, the dominant color in the ad using uh, this device here, the materials. And then here I give a definition of the term I'm using here and then how it applies to the billboard. Then I also looked at the printing technique to print the billboards, the size of the billboard. Then I looked at the layout and the structure of how things were placed and hierarchy. Uh, then I looked at uh, the brand. What does the brand mean? The messaging that is broadcast by the, the ads, the maze image, the gaze, the treatment. And, uh, and anyway, that was what I did. So let me show you how I uh, have focused. I'm going to focus on one, which is typography, so that you can understand the process that I went through for each of those categories that I showed you. And the other details will be available when I publish this research. So let's look at the lettering. So typography assists the brand name in projecting an image that the consumer will uh, not confuse with another. This is formed through uh, typeface selection and the arrangement of the letters and then applying to a Canadian typographer uh, called Carl Dare. He has two theories, one on contrast of size and one on contrast of color. The, con the font selected in the close up for the headline on the billboard is sans serif. This style of typeface used on the ad is called Franklin Gothic Extra Condensed and was very popular in the 1950s and again now in the digital age. The typeface appears very contemporary and fashion forward, which reinforces the launch of a new clothing line. Selecting a font that is not associated with another brand is very important in advertising so that the brand name can have its own unique visual appeal versus its competition. With Dare's contrast of color, the letters that are colored in yellow visually move toward the consumer, bringing the most important concept of beauty directly at the consumer's eye. And the use of second color for contrast, which is white on the billboard, complements the lettering of the logo, making it the main focal point on the package. The yellow used is the official yellow that is applied to their company packaging and has been used in their previous advertising campaigns. The logo typography, Palacio de Hierro is made up of a serif script, and this remits a classic image that appears to be hand drawn. The art of calligraphy was practiced by the ruling class in New Spain when creating and signing documents, and the logo uh, remits this time period. In this section, I have just explored uh, the tools and techniques and I showed you the charts that I used, and I also gave an example of how I examine one tool. And that was supported by design and semiotic theory. The tools and techniques of gaze, main image, narratives, typography and text, among others, reveal how a branded myth can be constructed, repeated over time in various medias to show what Barr states as how the denoted message neutralizes or naturalizes, sorry, the connoted message. In the next section, I will use a visual semiotic analysis to explore how advertising projects two messages, one the client pays for and the secondary message that supports branded cultural and historic myths. Advertising messages are broadcast to a specific uh, broadcast specific message. However, many contain a second level of communication, often promoting racial inequality, ideology or gender bias. The following analysis is of primary and secondary messaging that appears within the campaign. It's important to note that in rhetoric of the image, Barr states that the photograph uh, he analyzed offers three messages, a linguistic messages, a coded iconic message, and a non-coded iconic message. 
However, for this research, I am saying that advertising has two messages, one from the client, which is Palacio has new clothing, and the secondary message that reflect the cultural and, non and societal norms when the ad was created. For example, rich white people wear this product. The secondary message incorporates what Barth refers to within the three messages. So when I refer to the ad's message, I will refer to either the main message or the secondary message and not the three that Barth's is referring to. The main messages delivered by the client to the audience when looking at the billboard campaign is that total Placio collections are available to uh, or from the diverse Palacio Diero store. This message is supported through the central idea of the campaign that represents diversity by featuring uh, different uh, stereotypes, old age, unconventional beauty, androgyny, and overweight. And as reported in the Mexican press at the launch of the campaign, Palacio de Hierro wants to break stereotypes and promote diversity. And this message is what the brand and the ad agency want to be interpreted by the viewers of the campaign. Unfortunately, the main issue of diversity is not reflected in the ads by the fact that all of the models are white and do not feature anyone who represents 90% of the Mexican population. The ads only feature white models representing 10% of the Mexican population and no racial diversity is presented. The secondary messaging reveals a more complicated relationship between the brand and the Mexican population. This analysis is performed using semiotic theory, including visual semiotics, social semiotics, which was defined by Jewett and Oyama as the description of semiotic resources, what can be said and done with images and other visual means of communication, and how the things people say and do with images can be interpreted. And this method can be applied to discover the secondary meanings in the billboard campaign, as this is a useful tool for analyzing images and the relationship to text. My beauty has nothing to hide is the headline written for the billboard where a freckled 25 year old female stands with her designer clothing, exposing the skin on her shoulders and top of her breasts. The two white strips of material cover a brownish colored textured halter top that mirrors the pattern caused by the freckles covering the cheeks of the stereotyped model's face. This I call a sign that infers two things. One, that the model does not have perfect white skin. And second, that if freckles, if her freckles or her marks on her face join together, uh, th th it would then uh, replace the white skin of the model and she would be considered darker skinned or of mixed European and uh, indigenous blood. This could be thought of uh, as a first for the Palacio brand, but she is not that and that is what is important. Nearly brown skinned, but not quite, the gray background color in the ad emphasizes the whiteness of the skin that is complemented by the light colored clothing. The other signs that are also reflected in this image are brown hair, European facial features, young and female, and they all work together to emphasize the whiteness and higher social economic level of the model. She stands defiantly proud of her white and speckled skin that is not hidden behind makeup. Barthes also refers to denotation and connotation, which is where myth occurs when the consumer reads the connotative meaning as denotative. He defines two types of messages that are broadcast in images such as photographs. One is denoted and the other is connoted. The denoted is made up of the knowledge that the viewer receives from observing the photograph. The denoted message is the objective side of uh, photography, beginning and ending with what the photograph represents. So what is denotative of this image is that the female with marks on her skin and she is wearing clothing. What is connotative to the audience seeing the ad depends on which class the uh, class level the audience is when they're looking at the ad. The higher economic class consumer will see an attractive young white woman who is proud of her skin, including her dark freckles, because she is wearing expensive designer clothing. A lower socioeconomic class will see a huera, which is a Mexican slang for white female and they will see her with brown spots in her face that match her brown hair, wearing clothing that is not worn by people like them, from a brand that does not speak to them and from a brand they cannot afford. 
This type of advertising has a second message that creates an us versus them situation of otherness as proposed by uh, theorists Jacques Derard or Mountis, uh, where the consumer feels different and inferior to the model in the ad. Applying Barr's concept of linguistic message contained in the headline, my beauty has nothing to hide, the beauty can be interpreted as her white skin that is not hidden by clothing or hair or excessive makeup. She is not hiding the beauty of the brown spots on her skin through clothing that exposes and frames her body. The linguistic message demonstrates that she is proud of her beauty that is constructed by her perfect skin and designer clothing. Advertising messages are placed in a specific media to reach a certain audience that will interpret the message in a specific way. According to Hall, this interpretation is the dominant hegemonic position. Also, the ads will be seen in the use stage where the decoding of the message occurs. Palacio ads use linguistic and visual signs that together create a designed coded message directed to support the dominant hegemonic position. In the Palacio billboards, the intended audience will interpret the messages as the advertising agency and its client intended the messages to be portrayed. In this case, the ad is directed to people from a high socioeconomic class with a disposable income that allows them to buy the products advertised by the brand. These receivers will interpret the ad from a dominant hegemonic position, meaning El Palacio de Hierro supports stereotypes of gender, beauty, age, weight, but they all have to be encased in a white skin. According to Hall, there are audiences who will decode the message differently than what is intended, and this is the negotiated position. Hall identifies it as the audience that understands the text codes and mostly accepts the general meaning, but at the same time resisting and modifying the message so that it reflects their own um, ex life experiences and cultural background. However, Hall's third position, called oppositional, would be seen by a lower socioeconomic audience that cannot afford these types of clothes or accessories. They will interpret the message as these clothes are for rich white people. This is because people with colored skin are not featured in the advertising, so there is no one for the target to identify with. This form of omitting or erasure is discussed by Bonaventura de Sousa Santos in his 2018 book called The End of the Cognitive Empire with the concept of sociology of absences. And this is also touched upon by Audre Lords in their inter, uh, influential 2018 article, The Master's Tools Will Never Dism uh, Dismantle the Master's House. So to conclude, I used two semiotic methods to analyze this campaign. One was the tools and techniques used to construct the ad, and the second was a traditional semiotic study. This is to understand semiotically how the ads are constructed and then to understand how the consumers react to the advertising. The anti-stereotype billboard campaign from El Palacio de Hierro is a constructed visual communication designed through the application of various tools and techniques from advertising. This advertising campaign also broadcasts two messages, a main message and a secondary message. The secondary level of messaging uh, confronts the economic challenge viewer with the harsh realities of life in Mexico by presenting designer commodities that only the wealthy can afford. Even though the ads celebrate diversity, it is only white diversity and does not recognize the diversity of the other 90% of the population. The advertisements also are important through what they don't show, which are people of color. This reinforces the concept of erasure, which is uh, what is not shown uh, is forgotten. The ads can be considered a contemporary version of Las Pinturas de Castas, and these are paintings that are here that classify Mexicans, and they were created 500 years ago when the Spanish landed in the New World, and they were done to classify different groups of people. And in this case, we have constructed 2D visual communication depicting wealthy white citizens wearing uh, luxury goods. The Palacio de Hierro ads are a contemporary visual form that reflects colonial thinking. By applying advertising tools and techniques to encode brands, we can observe how and why brand meaning is constructed to create a brand, revealing the tools and techniques of gaze, main image, narratives, and others, demonstrating how a branded myth 
can be constructed to develop strategies of power and how cultural meanings are filtered and encoded through the advertising process. The encoding process demonstrates advertising ideological power where advertising agencies or institutions where cultural creativity and commercial business objectives coexist and collide with discourses of capitalism and culture become enmeshed and intertwines. And this is why we need to decolonize advertising. This semiotic analysis concludes that the cultural history cultivated by the ruling families is unconsciously maintained through messages that portray values that indirectly reinforce their class power. This, in this case, it is a myth that is defined uh, by the way it utters its message, where the message is broadcast through paid mass media, reflecting the social and cultural values created over 500 years ago that are now so ingrained in Mexican society that they are not questioned and are part of the construction of modern Mexico. The power representations that are presented through 2D advertising is the cultivated myth of the light-skinned ruling class. This translates into advertising that mostly features light-skinned actors, creating a myth that white is superior and therefore aspirational to consumers leading to the discussion on why advertising needs to be decolonized. So what are the next steps of decolonizing the advertising process? Um, it, it is felt that secondary advertising messaging broadcast by 2D ads need to be explored through semiotic research. This will help them be understood. And in order for the client and its advertising agency to acknowledge that their 2D communication broadcasts a second level of messages on theme such as racism and classism. As demonstrated in this research, the analysis of the final message could be performed through semiotic analysis on the advertising before it is published so that adjustments can be made before production, thereby decolonizing one of the processes. This research reveals that the tools and techniques of advertising can be used to create myths that support the ruling class and erase a large group of peoples. Advertising agencies and brands need to recognize the role these tools and techniques play in supporting these damaging 500 year old colonial narratives that erase or harm some sections of Mexican society. After recognition, the tools and techniques can be wisely appropriated to construct a more egalitarian branded message. After decolonizing, um, another decolonizing proposal that I'm offering could be that the advertising industry as a whole adopt a principle that promotes the casting of models that reflect all four different basic ethnic groups in Mexico, indigenous, Afro-Mexican, mestizo, and Caucasian to uh, allow the racist and classist power relationships to be resisted by consumers, Mexican brands and advertising agencies are advised to recognize and adopt some of the above decolonizing proposals that will allow for the creation of ethically designed visual communication. That is how we can decolonize advertising and all this is done to liberate consumers. Uh, thank you very much and uh, Thank That's you it. for your uh, presentation. It was uh, interesting. So uh, I think now we have uh, the time for Q and A. It actually is the most uh, interactive part of our panel. So I think uh, Carl will uh, want to drink a, a glass with water <laughs> in order to recover. So uh, I will uh, invite you to address questions regarding the presentations, ask questions, have remarks. So feel free to intervene, please. Um, I wanted to ask, actually, Konstantinos. Hey, um, what I wanted to ask was, uh, did you find any other examples um, when you were talking about this new orientation and cultivating a need? Like you featured the robot, the vacuum cleaner. Did you see any other ones that you were considering but rejected? Uh, yes, although I did not uh, complete my research, I think... For example, there are some uh, uh, some cases about 3D printers. For example, uh, uh, they in, in uh, the recent years there has been an uh, increased 
um, number of advertisements and also articles in uh, technology related sites about 3D printers covering everything from uh, uh, benchmarking different models, how you can use them, etc. Now, and at some point, it seems that uh, the 3D printer would be the evolution of, of the classical printer, which is not the case because 3D print, printing is about building things, not printing pages. Sorry so, for my interruption. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to, to close the session because uh, the, the next panel is already uh, begun. Uh, okay. Maybe uh, we, can, we have the chance to continue our intervention and uh, exchange our ideas. Thank you for an excellent presentation and uh, I invite you to master lecture of Mihail Ilin. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye-bye. Bye, Danielle. Great to meet you. <laughs>